In a recent survey conducted by the Korea Tourism Organization, 77% of respondents from France and the UK said they became more interested in Korea thanks to the Korean wave, known here as Hallyu. So, but what do the experts think? Tonight we turn to one to find out. Nick Powell is the director of the National Film and Television School in the UK, and he joins us now. Thank you very much for being here. And let's start with why you're here. Uh, what's brought you to Korea? I'm here um, to speak at, uh, at a conference on, um, uh, on Hallyu, on K-pop, on the Korean wave, on what we call in England Kim Sheik, and, uh, um, and, uh, and it's been a really interesting discussion with uh, people from the industry, with professors, uh, but no, no actual K-pop stars. I was disappointed about that. You were disappointed about that? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to see the Generation Girls. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I'm sure they wanted to see you as yeah. well. Uh, we're going to get into that presentation mm. and what it entails in just a little bit, but you mentioned right there off the bat, Kim Sheik is what it's called in the UK. Where did that come from? I think that probably came from a journalist, Kim Sheik, or some clever wag on the internet. Uh, but it sums it up because Kim Sheik is, is, there's a coolness about that that is cooler than, you know, Hallyu or the Korean New Wave or K-pop. But Kim Sheik means, you yeah, know, it's cool. It's okay to, to dress in Korean fashions, to eat Korean food, to get Korean surgery, to uh, listen to Korean pop music, to watch Korean uh, soaps, to, uh, uh, and of course, coolest of all, to watch Korean films. The way you describe it there, it makes it sound like uh, K-pop, Korean culture, uh, Kim Sheik, as they call it there, uh, is, is very popular or rather popular. How, how popular is it in, uh, in the UK? Different parts of, of Korean culture are popular amongst different parts of the population. Obviously, K-pop is really popular amongst all of the Asian population of, uh, of the UK, which, of course, is very large and is spilling over to, to the rest of the, the English population, whereas, say, uh, Korean Films are extremely popular um, amongst uh, film buffs and film aficionados, but, but because they are art films, they are go less wide, apart from things like The Host. And uh, Korean food is, is certainly much more popular now than it used to be. Uh, Korean fashion, don't ask me, I'm, I'm not big <laughs> on fashion, as you can see. Uh, and. Um, so yeah, different, uh, but it's there and a very high profile. And we're talking about a wide range of things there, or you were. Um, what specifically is the appeal then of the Korean brand as compared to you know, a British brand or the American brand or a band or film? What is the Korean appeal there? It's difficult to sort of isolate it, but you can isolate it certainly in K-pop. You know, K-pop is incredibly versatile dancers, very good-looking artists, singing extremely well-produced uh, uh, songs uh, that are very danceable too. And um, so that you, you can kind of isolate the, the fundamentals, which, uh, uh, whereas, say, in film, it's much, much more diverse to, um, to, com film, to compare films like The Host, you know, to Park Chanwood's Old Boy, to uh, The Thieves, you know, these are very different kinds of films. I think the thing that I isolate in a lot of Korean culture is energy, huge amount of energy, and a lot of charm. And maybe not in The Host, but in most of the other ones. Sure, sure. And you personally, what, what, uh, what do you find interesting about Korean culture, K-pop, or, or films? Well, I love, I love pop music. I have since I was young, uh, so to me, I'm not as uh, I'm not intellectually snobbish about popular culture. Uh, I love the fact that you know there are a lot of things that the Korea today has in common with uh, Britain of the 1960s. You know, Britain was sandwiched between America and continental Europe. Korea is between China and Japan. So somehow we're trying to re-establish our identities. We have uh, had both been through quite difficult times, us obviously World War II, Korea and its civil war, and rebuilding uh, things. And one of the ways that young people have been able to do that is through their expressing themselves through, 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 through their culture. And there are a lot of things in common. I mean, one of the biggest things that uh, Korean culture has in common with, 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 uh, with British popular culture of the 60s is that is they both have imported cultures from other parts of the world and then re-express them 
in their own culture and giving them giving those uh, those imported cultures a whole fresh and new have given a whole fresh and new uh, thing to 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 their music or to their films. And what you're doing now is, I think, basically going over the crux of your presentation last week to the uh, Global Culture Exchange Forum 2013. Give us a little bit more insight about what you said to them and what your uh, basic conclusion was uh, during that presentation. Yeah. My main thing when I gave the presentation was, um, was having said what I've just said about importing cultures and uh, so on and being similar to, to the UK, was that if you want to move K-pop on and get it into a true global brand in talking here in the music part of, uh, of Korean culture, then the artists need to be developed and they need to probably write their own material and they need to establish in a way bigger individual identities for the individual bands so they're no longer seen as part of of a group of bands. In the 60s in the UK, first of all, there was British pop, all the bands seemed fairly similar. They came from Northern England, they had similar haircuts, clothes, and so on and so forth. And, and the songs were, were not dissimilar. But soon the leaders emerged, like the Beatles and the Stones, and became very individual, and then were followed by, you know, as bigger bands, Pink Floyd and wider bands. So what I was saying in the, in the conference was they need to, to pick out the, the really talented um, idol bands or individuals and develop them into worldwide artists and they need to develop their songwriting abilities to go that way because while their songs are written and their records produced by the same producers they will all have a very similar sound and they need to create their own identities but I think that's absolutely possible many of you know the Beatles when they started were a teenage idol band right. five years later they were doing Sgt Pepper so, you know, these changes uh, can take place and, and much more quickly than people think. You know, the Big Bang, they write their own songs, their own material. They, for me, would be a band that should be developed into potential worldwide band that, that could, you know, be as big as a U2, could be as, as, as big as any number of, of worldwide bands. So, so what are they doing right now that they're not doing, that, they, that maybe they should be doing to, to reach that level? Well, first of all, a lot of them are not writing their own songs. The majority, Big Bang, are an exception. So, you know, they need to start writing their own songs. Uh, second, so that they can create identities uh, uh, and write music that is related to the world that they live in rather than related to their producer's world. You know, they have to be, in a way, less, less reliant on, on a particular sound and more reliant on, on their own individual craft. Uh, that said, you know, there are, of course, non-idle um, uh, uh, musicians and uh, artists in Korea, and I don't know those so well, uh, but from what I understand, you know, they too need to be developed because if you look at Britain in the 60s or indeed America at, at similar times, uh, there, are, there are bands like the Rolling Stones, like Pink Floyd and so on, who never went through that teenage phase and came straight into the world wide market. However, you're talking about a country uh, here in Korea that really celebrates its stars, uh, perhaps even more than its musicians. You're, you're basically making a distinction here between the musicians and the quote-unquote stars, the ones that uh, have sort of been manufactured, put through the process. How do you sort of break through that, that, uh, that barrier, though, if that's the, the way of thinking here in the country? I don't, I don't think it's a barrier. I think these... The the, the, the Beatles and other uh, bands of, of, of England's early 60s were, were also stars first and musicians second. And, and only became, people only recognized the musicianship, you know, as they started to write their big hits. And, uh, you know, they all dressed in the same suits, they all had the same haircuts, they all did the same moves on stage in the early days. So, you know, it's not actually, you know, so different. So people start, and then they develop. And the most important thing for those artists is that if they need to develop because their audience is developing. Their audience doesn't stay the same. You know, the, those teenage girls get into their 20s, or boys get into 20s and get into their 30s. And if you, if I were one of those bands, I want to grow with that because the next lot of teenage idols coming along, uh, you know, will take over that teenage audience and you need to take your audience with you. And that's what these bands in the 60s and American bands like Beach Boys and so on, similar situations, took with them, uh, the, their audience, as, and their music developed with the audience and the audience helped develop the music. 
How big an issue is the language barrier in all of this? Well, I always say the language barrier is an issue in America, England, and Australia, <laughs> but nowhere else because the English is a second language to the majority of the world, and so is Korean. So it's in the same position. And of course, they can, they can sing their songs in English, and there's lots of examples. ABBA, I suppose, is the main one. You know, their first language was Swedish, but they did all English songs. They're right. a worldwide phenomenon. Stage shows, films, 20 years later after they split up. Phenomenal thing. There's no reason that uh, uh, Korean artists couldn't take that as a model as well. Getting back uh, briefly here to your presentation. In it, you had an interesting sentence. I want to ask you about it. You said, quote, perfect men can only be found in books. You actually changed the word books into Korea. So basically, perfect men can only be found in Korea. That is quite an endorsement, I must say. Explain that for us. Yeah, I didn't write that, but it was on the internet. I think it had been written by fans. And it was really nice. I thought, that's really nice. So that's why I put it into the presentation, just to, to uh, show, because what it demonstrated is that, you know, looks are important, as they have always been for all great stars, right from early Hollywood. And they, um, and they're appreciated, and I thought it was like quite humorous. Does K-pop has the right look then? I mean, in your opinion? Well, it has the right look for the for the teenagers across the Asian diaspora. The people who uh, buy the music, sure. The people who buy the music, people who buy the posters, and so on, and and go to the shows. And I suspect it it, it will have a very good look for the rest of the world. Although there there are some clashes, you know. Uh, right. It's a in inverted commas a much softer look than the Western equivalent. Uh, but the boy bands, when you compare the, the Korean K-pop artists to the boy bands of, of the UK or America, um, you know, they're both quite a fat. They're not, uh, you know, exactly going to be in American football or British rugby. Right. So, you know, they, it's not so different. You also said in your presentation that making good use of outside culture is essential to globalizing the local uh, culture. That's an interesting statement. Can you explain that a bit for us as well? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, I think it's, 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 it really helps if, if a smaller culture absorbs the other cultures of the world and then makes those their own. And, but, but when they re-export that, there are elements of it that the rest of the world recognizes. And that's what the Brits did with American, mainly black rhythm and blues uh, culture of the 60s, that's what the Koreans are doing now. And that's why I think they have a, a real chance of success. And how, how are they doing it now specifically? What do you, what do you see there? What are they sort well, of doing? Well, they're importing, in you know, dance, hip hop, rap, uh, obviously bubblegum pop. Uh, th those come from mainly America because the American influence in Korea, of course, is enormously strong. Uh, uh, much bigger than the British uh, influence. So I think most of their culture is being imported. But of course, uh, uh, no doubt, they are also importing, uh, s in a smaller way, stuff from J-pop. And of course, they have their own culture. Now, we've gone almost 15 minutes now without mentioning Psy, which might that be a record. a world record. Yeah, I think it might be. <laughs> uh, obviously, he's become a household name over the past uh, six or seven months or whatever it has been throughout the world. Uh, why him? Why now, from your perspective? Yeah, why, why, why Psy, why now? Uh, I don't think anyone can truly answer that question. Uh, for some reason, he reminds me of Roy Orbison. I don't know why. Maybe he looks like him. Maybe the voice is a bit like his. But, uh, uh, but uh, I go back to, to, you know, he has enormous energy, enormous charm. He writes his own songs, so he's in command of, of his own career. Uh, that doesn't explain, but I think when you come to explain these kind of phenomena in entertainment, no one can explain, you know, the first Star Wars or, uh, you know, Beatles having five of the top ten hits back in 1964 or five. You know, these things are very difficult to, to explain. But I think that uh, I also, the song is also in Europe, we have, uh, we have these summer songs, which are very danceable, which are often very funny. Uh, which everybody plays in the clubs during the summer. And I think this started out there. This was like released in the summer and I think it went straight into, into, the, into the, cl the, the seaside clubs, if you like, of, of Europe. In, and, uh, and everybody was dancing it in five minutes because it's eminently danceable. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, they make fantastic videos here. I mean, pop videos, right. you know, the, the pop video for, uh, for, for Psy here is, is fantastic. And it is a fun and summer expensive. song. 
Exactly, yeah, and, and he, he shot it in a very short period of time, yeah. too, which is also interesting. Uh, I think the big question, the one that Sai is probably asking himself right now, is what can he do next? What, how can he follow up this huge hit and uh, continue this success? Yeah. Any advice for him? Uh, my advice to Sai is not to try. Uh, you know, I think he's had one huge hit. I think, you know, he, he writes his own material, he writes his own songs, he can have many further hits, but he may never have a hit that will be as big as this one because this is a phenomenon, but he certainly could continue to have a very successful career because, as I say, he writes his own material, his own songs, and, 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 and they're, they're cool songs. He's, he's done something that many Korean artists are hoping to do. He's become a household name. He's, he's gotten mm. huge throughout the world. What is the ceiling, from your perspective, for K-pop throughout the rest of the world? How, how big could it get if they did everything right? If they did everything right, I think Korea could become a, you know, one of the capitals of popular music, uh, of global popular music, you know, together with America, together with the UK, those are the other two biggest bases of, of popular music, and, and I think Korea could become the third. And, you know, as big certainly as the UK, um, partly because it also has a fantastically solid base here in, in Southeast Asia, or indeed in Asia. Right, and that's a high ceiling you're talking about there, but what obstacles do you see, what concerns do you have about the growth of K-pop? I think the biggest uh, challenges for K-pop are, are to develop itself, you know, out of just bubblegum dance, you know, uh, or its bubblegum dance origins. I think if it succeeds in doing that, if it can develop a, uh, uh, different artists with their own images, so their own images are actually bigger than, than the K-pop image, you know, so that the Beatles are not just part of the British invasion of America in the 60s, they become bigger than that. So I think that those are the main challenges writing great songs and having great production and so on. They're doing a lot of that already. It's just doing more of it and better. Are, are they marketing it in the right way, do you think? I think the marketing is, uh, is fantastic. I mean, uh, most, uh, neither America nor the UK, at least formally, had, you know, had real government policies to support it. In fact, most, if you watch the old television programs of the 60s, whether in America or or in the UK, you know, the, the parental generation had no idea what this was all about. They actually hated it and they attacked it and they called it uh, valueless and so on and so forth. Whereas here, I think uh, the people I speak to here, even of my generation, are really proud of it and um, supportive of it. And the government is very supportive of it and sees it as doing two things. You know, one is making money in its own right and the other, of course, is, is is complementing, you know, the big companies like Samsung and Hyundai and their ability to sell their products overseas. We're talking a lot about K-pop. Uh, another issue uh, or another thing being exported is Korean films. Uh, you also focus part of your presentation on that. Uh, what potential do you see for Korean film overseas? We've seen some of that come to fruition here uh, just recently. Yeah, but Korean films, I think it's much tougher for film than it is uh, for popular music. Why is that? Uh, well, partly because popular music has, you know, uh, the YouTubes of the world and therefore can give immediate access to the whole of the world's population to their product. And of course, that's much harder to do on film or well, you can't really do it in the same way on film. Secondly, you know, the, the, the big commercial market and distribution, you know, what we call the industrial film business is very firmly centered in Hollywood. Many people have tried to topple Hollywood. None have succeeded in 100 years. Some have joined them or bought them, but never, you know, the, those same studios exist today that existed 50 years ago or 75 years ago. Very tough. Uh, they know their business, basically. So, uh, but Korean film can be as successful as independent film. It can have uh, occasional worldwide hits, like, like the French industry does, like the UK industry does. Uh, and why I think it can do it as opposed to maybe the other countries in, in this region is because, A, it has a great diversity of cinema. You know, the films of Kim Ki-duk, uh, you know, are very different from The Host and The Thieves and uh, Park Chan-wood is different again. So they have a fantastic diversity. Secondly, they, they straddle very well this... Uh, um, 
the, the, they straddle very well the two genres of what you might call entertainment film, films again like The Host and Thieves, you know, with real art films, um, uh, such as Old Boy and uh, Spring, Summer, Autumn and Number Nine and so on. They managed to somehow put those together and, and that's another similarity to the UK where we have our Ken Loaches and our Mike Lees but we also have our Harry Potters and uh, uh, and Les Miserables and big worldwide hits so you know I think uh, it's another part of the similarity between Korea and and the UK and in, in the position we are in the world. Is there any lesson to be learned from Bollywood anything that Korea could pick up? Well from I think they, they have a similar chart Chain, uh, they have a, a similar challenge, you know, in that they have a fantastic home base. You know, they have already, uh, you know, achieved, you know, Korean films account for more than 50% of the box office of Korea. This is the only country in the world other than China, India, and uh, France that achieves this. Um, uh, but Bollywood have a much bigger problem because the genre of the kind of films they make is, is musical, and this is not to the taste to a large part of the world. So Bollywood does brilliantly within the, the uh, Indian Asian subcontinent uh, diaspora, but not so well uh, with the rest of the world. Whereas I think Korean film will be more like French film, which you know exports uh, across the uh, art market, but they say the art film market, but exports in the niche market extremely successfully many films every year. We're talking about K-pop, we're talking about Korean film, we're talking about these types of things, historical dramas. These are the sort of the main things that people think of now when they think of the Korean brand. Mm. Do you think this is the right way to spread the message uh, t to get uh, Korea's brand name out there? Yeah, uh, I do think it's like that. I think because there's a freshness, an energy, a charm, a, um, uh, and it invites, you know, all art and entertainment invites people into the world of, of, of the p artist or singer or, or country that is, is concerned. So, and I think the more people know, the, uh, the more comfortable they feel, the more they can relate to the things in the songs. And, and so I think it, it really helps. I think you've already given a lot of advice here today, but if you had to give a last piece of advice to people who are really trying to push K-pop and these types of things overseas, what would you tell them? I would tell them to, to, to identify those artists of real potential and to develop those artists into worldwide successes and encourage them to write uh, their own songs and material. Nick Powell, thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you as always for watching. We'll see you next week after 10.